So welcome and happy 2021. I predict this will be the year of reunions. Um, it'll be a time for once again, we'll, we, we'll be able to hug our family and friends in person, not virtually, and that we'll be able to shake hands with our colleagues once again. Today is a very busy day. It already started this morning at our state legislature down at the Capitol with organizational days. And what that starts out with is the swearing in of our new state legislature. So I know that our two speakers, keynote speakers later today, have been very busy already this morning. And they are already voting on bills already. Now we're at the forum. And then for those of you who just happen to be college football fans, hmm, tonight we have a national championship game. So looking forward to that. So today I was reflecting on the brighter side of uh, virtual forums, since that seems to be the norm right now. And a couple of points uh, that made me think, this isn't as bad as, as it's made out to be. First of all, um, some of you are joining us from remote locations. And so you may not have ever even been to a forum before. So we welcome all of you. And the second thing is, I don't have to commute. There's no commute. So as soon as we wrap up here, you can go right into your next Zoom meeting. So the gift of time, there you go. So let me tease you just a little bit. Um, later on, we're gonna hear about a very exciting competition that's going on, the Salem East Challenge. This is an endeavor of the Salem Chamber in conjunction with Summit Valley Bank. Very exciting news. Let's get started. I'd like to introduce you to Greg Peterson. He is from God Be the Glory to God Be the Glory Church. He's going to lead us in our Pledge of Allegiance and Invocation this morning. He is an amazing leader in our African-American community here in the Salem, Oregon area, and has also been the chair of the local chapter of the NAACP. Greg, please start us off. Hey, good morning. Thank you guys for having me, for allowing me the opportunity to be a part of this with you guys. Uh, former board member for the chamber for years, and a former business owner for 22 years in Salem. So I really appreciate the opportunity to be with the Salem Chamber. Uh, we're gonna say a pledge of allegiance to the flag first. The flag is behind me. So we please join me. I pledge allegiance to the flag of the United States of America and to the Republic for which it stands, one nation under God, indivisible with liberty and justice for all. I want to, uh, before I pray, I want to read a scripture I read this morning in my daily prayer. And it's uh, Saul, who's a persecutor of Christians on his journey to Damascus. As he was going, he was struck by light and the light was so bright it caused him to fall to the ground on their knees. And a voice spoke out to him and he questioned the voice, is that you Lord? And, uh, and it says, I am, I'm the one you're persecuting. The Lord replied, now get up and stand on your feet. I have appeared to you to appoint you as a servant and a witness of what you have seen and will see of me. In the midst of that moment, he was called to action, to stand up and to serve. So let's pray. Father God, as we come before you, Lord, servants of our, our God Almighty, that we're asked, Lord, that if you stop us in this moment to stand to our feet and to see you, to serve you. As one nation under God, Lord, we want to remain in the midst of who you are as this body and as leaders in this community. Father God, we come before you, Lord, humble servants, to seek your will in our communities, Lord, and in our lives. As you stop each and every one of us, Lord, we pray that you uh, touch our hearts. You guide us as individuals directly, Lord, on a path and a journey you have for us. And Lord, in the blessings that we receive, Lord, in journeying together, we thank you. We thank you for each man and each woman on this, in this meeting, Lord, for their specific journey, Lord. But we thank you for the call of action together as a community. As leaders, Lord, we want to be in the forefront uh, in that scripture, Lord, it says, 
to take from darkness to light, Lord, and we seek your light in our community to strengthen us in the most difficult time in our communities, in our nation, in our world, Lord, when the whole world is praying for guidance through a pandemic, Lord, and we're all suffering the same ill will for the first time in the history of the world, everyone's mind is focused on you and healing a community. So we pray, Lord, that healing on this community, Lord. We pray for all those who put extra energy and work in, those frontline workers, Lord, who are putting in so much every single day to keep us above the fray and the water, Lord. We pray, Father God, as we lead in our communities in a difficult time where there's so much division that you bring us all together, Lord, that you unite us in that common cause, that we find those things that are like-minded for us and we walk in that path and on that journey, Lord. Touch us. We ask a blessing for these leaders in this community uh, in the city of Salem, a city of peace, Salaam, Lord, that you continue to help us be light in our community and we lead and guide. And we ask all this in the name of our mighty God, amen. Thank you so much, Greg. That was wonderful, a great invocation. Thank you so much. And next, uh, just a very special part of the forum. At the Salem Chamber, we believe in helping businesses prosper so that our community may thrive. The Spirit of Salem Award is our chance to recognize the influencers who put Salem first and inspire other individuals to become champions in our city. Today's recipient paved the way for many to feel a sense of belonging in the city, our state, but has, her work has never been easy. Mrs. Willie Richardson serves as president of the 501c3 nonprofit organization, Oregon Black Pioneers. In her volunteer role, Willie leads the organization's efforts to recognize and preserve the history and involvement of African-Americans statewide. Oregon Black Pioneers since 1963 has illuminated the seldom told history of people of African descent in Oregon. We are inspired by the tenacity of Black Oregonians who have faced discrimination and hardship to make a life for themselves in Oregon over the past 400 years. Their sacrifices and journeys are accounted for in stories and publications which are shared with the public nationwide. Willie's leadership has placed Oregon Black Pioneers as the preeminent resource for the study of Oregon's African-American history and culture, allowing students, historians, elected officials, and our entire citizenry to better understand the impact African-Americans played in Oregon's rich history along with the immense challenges they faced, the, the people of color faced over the hundreds of years within our state, as well as the challenges they face today. Many Salem Chamber members will reflect on Willie's involvement as a small business owner in downtown Salem. Willie's Hats, a former retail boutique on Ferry Street, was a location for women to upgrade and elevate their visual appearance and confidence. Willie warmly served customers with laughter and encouragement. Whether you were seeking a wardrobe to upgrade for a wedding, special occasion, or you were going to an important interview or public event, Willie had a special knack for matching the beautiful headpiece that best represented the heart and attitude of her customer. Everyone had a home in Willie's presence and we still do today. Tom Hoffert reflected on meeting Willie for the very first time. I remember meeting Willie while interning at the Salem Chamber. Somehow I got caught between Jackie Winters and Willie in our, in our conference room following a governmental affairs meeting. Jackie told me I was going to be in the political world. I'd better pay Willie a visit down at her shop as my hair would be falling out quickly. Oh my. Little did I know it was a women's hat shop. But Mike McLaren and Senator Winters knew the real reason behind sending me to visit Willie. It stands as one, if not the most important member interviews I ever conducted. To hear a firsthand account of what it meant to be a black woman in Salem, Oregon inspired me and equally made me reflect on the struggle for equality and opportunity too many people of color faced as residents and entrepreneurs of our state. Willie Richardson conquered many difficulties, but remained optimistic 
that the advancement of colored people can continue to occur through education and activation. She is a role model and community leader, not only for the African-American community, but for all Oregonians. And most importantly, her work has not concluded yet. In her retirement years, Willie has remained active in advancing the mission of the Oregon Black Pioneers. Her compassion is unparalleled, as is her optimism. The Salem business community is honored to link arms with Willie in advancing social justice initiatives statewide while chronicling struggle and triumphs of African Americans in Oregon. Please help me congratulate Willie Richardson, our Spirit of Salem Award recipient. Yeah, thank you very much for uh, such kind, kind, kind words, um, which means I've got to do a better job of um, coordinating off, coordinating off um, who I am and what I do. I'm, I try to do things quietly, um, but with a loud mouth at the same time. Um, to the chamber leadership and the honorables who are present, and to each of you who have signed on for this um, today, I want to bid you um, good morning or good afternoon. I cannot see the clock, and it might be right on time. And my hat, I don't normally do hats with Zoom meetings, but I had to honor my friend Tom. He was so concerned about me and my hat. And I found one that worked, Tom. Is it okay with you? <laughs> um, I wanna thank you um, for this recognition um, with the Spirit of Salem Award. As I said earlier, I, I, I am surprised, but I do accept it with honor and humility. And I also want to thank my family because my family was the driving force behind my community engagement. And most specifically to my husband, who's been a part of my life for 56 years. Thomas has sat quietly back and let his wife gallivant around Salem and Oregon, um, doing, um, what I believe is my mission on earth. Shortly after arriving in Salem, I heard and experienced black ice and being stopped by the police for no apparent reason other than to let me know they knew that I was here. Early into 1979, I experienced culture shock and sheer fright for my children while at Willamette Town Center. After getting my children safely home, except for going to work, I did not venture out for several weeks without my children. This way of living was not going to be sustainable so I had to decide about staying or leaving this place of whiteness. I chose to stay and that began my citizenship in Salem and Oregon. I share that because it has relevance to you today. Considering what transpired on Wednesday, in our capital um, and put all of us in jeopardy. I wondered what to say today, other than thank you, accept my award and sit down. I tried my utmost to think about Salem as a healthy community for its citizens from the past to the present. Truth is, no such thing existed in the past, nor does it exist today. That is difficult for me to say as I'm receiving this award, 
and I'm sure uncomfortable for some of you to hear. As seen across the nation, Salem have all of the same issues, good and bad, and all non-white communities are experiencing racism and discriminatory practices on some scale. And this includes white supremacists roaming our streets and our neighborhoods. It is not to say that Salem and its leadership components have not made strides to bring change and the city to become a welcoming place for all of its citizens so that none feel disenfranchised or harmed. News flash for you out there in Zoom land. That is not, however, where all the work needs to be done. Individually, we have a role and a responsibility in our communities. Our religious institutions, and there are many of them, of which some of you attend and hold leadership positions must be responsible to fulfilling its role in teaching the tenets of Christ to its members and that any member who accepts Christ must not set those beliefs aside in favor of a person, a political party. Each, each of us must remember that God created us in his image and his son Christ Jesus charged us to love one another. My vision for a healthy Salem is you, it is you. Because truly it is going to be you that make the changes in thoughts and culture that will move Salem to be a healthy community. The people most affected by grievous treatment and conditions can only do so much in the fight. For years, I have been saying the laws of the civil rights movement brought some relief. However, the one thing that was needed most did not occur. And that is the hearts of many changed little and continued to perpetuate decay and decline in our humanity for each other. Hence, where today we live in a visibly divided country. In America, for 400 years, black people have been trying to fix and solve the problems of racism and discrimination, racial inequality, police brutality, unequal justice, and on and on and on so that any neighborhood we choose to live in will be safe and healthy and welcoming to all. White Americans, for the most part, turned a blind eye and fixated on the privileges of being white with controlling power while attempting to convince people like me, the oppressed, their daily lived experiences are not true. That it is all in the imagination. Being jolted to a state of woke to the reality of racism and unequal treatment began for more whites when, if you had the grit and the stomach to watch the nine minute murder tape of George Floyd, and then followed by seeing your white children hitting the streets alongside others in protest, reality began to sink in. And for many of those young people, to a large extent, it was a rejection of their legacy of white privilege. This comes after Black people have been saying for years 
that black males were being killed with impunity and to make the gravity of silence evidentiary we saw the seat of democracy permitted for the most part to be trampled with little obstruction in comparison to the stark contrast of peaceful protesters. We've been hearing a lot said about the reckoning. The reckoning for white America and particularly those that profess to be followers of Christ is now. A healthy community is going to require you to examine and self-reflect on your individual beliefs and deciding what role you will play henceforth to ensure that Salem is really the healthiest community you want. The oppressed can no longer be the only fighters to dismantle the systemic and vitriolic racial divide which prevents communities from being healthy and whole. It is now a job that white people must confront and become a leader in resolving alongside the rest of us. This will require you to be willing to challenge racism and discriminatory behaviors in your circles, beginning with what you say, what you do, or permit in your home, businesses, churches, social groups. If you do nothing and remain silent, you are giving consent and is complicit. Any outspoken action you take will have a price to it. When you tell your favorite family member or friend to peddle their thoughts or beliefs elsewhere, they may stop speaking to you. It would mean checking that business partner of that customer so they'll know where you stand. They may stop doing business with you or speaking with you. You have got to figure out a way to be willing to stake a claim to who you are as a person. If you're not engaged in some capacity to fight all forms of racism in this beloved community of ours and in your space, it will not be the community you want. You must activate and join the fight if you're not already doing so. I believe each of us is on this earth for a reason and God has a plan and a mission for you daily. Seek it, accept it, lean into it and do it. Salem will become better for it to the chamber. This is an honor. And I thank you for your kindness in evaluating my presence here and saw value in my contributions by selecting me for embodying the true spirit of Salem. It is with a deep sense of honor and humility that it is accepted. I look forward to seeing more of you in the fight for the soul of our city and for it to be a place that welcomes all. I want you each to be safe and to be well. Thank you. Willie, on behalf of our organization, our board of directors and 
uh, the people that put in years and years of effort to make this chamber an inclusive and encompassing environment. We salute you and thank you for your efforts. But we know the work is hard and there's a lot of work ahead. There should never be Salem businesses that fear being admonished, harassed, or potential violence faced due to issues of race and hate. And this organization remains steadfast in pushing this city forward. And we ask the partnership of each business owner and employee in this city to help Salem move forward and bring more people to the table uh, in efforts that you've noted. And we see what happens when hate is in the heart. We've seen it at the, at the Capitol in Washington, D.C., but we've seen it on downtown in Salem, Oregon. And so I call to action on behalf of our board of directors, our entire business leadership uh, to be a hate-free area, a place where everyone has a home. And I thank you for your address and keynote and know that this organization supports social justice, but making Salem a place where everybody feels safe and has a home. So thank you, Willie. I've been asked to uh, provide a brief uh, comment regarding our change in speakers. And I appreciate uh, the Salem Chamber uh, members for uh, logging on uh, to a program that was intended to be Congressman Kurt Schrader. Uh, as some of you are aware, on Friday afternoon, uh, there were inflammatory, there was an inflammatory comment made by Congressman Schrader. Uh, and this, in the view of this organization, and especially our efforts to uh, bring safety and a welcoming environment for all individuals in our city and our businesses, uh, we felt a pivot was necessary. And we're very fortunate to have two key leaders uh, that Matthew will introduce uh, coming up. But know that this organization is a place where everybody has a home. Those are not words we state, but those are words we live by. Uh, from our board, to our staff, to each of the businesses in Salem, we are proud to be inclusive and representative of all people in our community and all people have a voice. With that, I will turn it over to President Gordon for an introduction of our sponsor, uh, Matthew K. Spear with Capital Auto Group. Thank you, Tom. The Salem Chamber has been blessed with tremendous support from our local new car dealers. From Mike and Tammy Roberson, Dick and David Withnell, Tom DeLon, and the Donna Frio family. The Salem Chamber has been blessed with those putting their new wheels under us and keeping us moving forward. However, none have been in support of this organization longer than the owners at Capital Auto Group. Douglas McKay founded the Douglas McKay Chevrolet Company in, 1950, in 1927 and subsequently joined the Salem Chamber. McKay would go on to serve as mayor of Salem, state senator, Oregon governor, and even serve as Secretary of the Interior under President Dwight Eisenhower. No pressure, Matthew. <laughs> Those are big shoes to fill. McKay eventually sold to his two sons-in-law, Lester Green and Wayne Hadley, who managed the company for many years. The business continued to find success in Salem, and in 1977, Scott Casebeer married into the family. Taking the company to the next level of expansion and brand growth, Scott brought into bought, excuse me, bought out Green and Hadley and renamed the dealership Capital Auto Group. Scott and K Carrie Casebeer, along with Scott's sons, Matthew and Alex, have invested heavily into making Salem a healthy and vibrant community. Capital Auto Group serves customers throughout the state of Oregon, and they've come to understand some basics when it comes to properly serving their loyal partners in auto ownership. They take great care of their employees and remain active in various initiatives to keep Salem's less fortunate, to help Salem's less fortunate and most needy. Their partnership work with United Way is profound, but you will see their footprint in many other nonprofit organizations by encouraging their employees to be active and engaged. 
Notably, Capital Auto Group has been named one of Oregon's top 100 green companies. They have a skilled and committed sales staff and many years of experiencing, experience satisfying their customers' needs. Browse their inventory in person or online to see one of the most comprehensive inventories of Chevrolets, Toyotas, and Subarus in the Northwest. You never need to leave Salem to purchase a new car. I am sure Matthew will provide us with a preview of the new and expanded Subaru footprint they are complete, competing, pleading just off the parkway. Allow me to introduce Matthew Casebeer, dealer for Capital Toyota and Chevrolet. Matthew states he has served the family business his entire life. Hmm, well, at least since 2009. Matthew partners with their employees to make Capital Auto Group a fun and low pressure environment for customers to wait allowing great service and products to captivate those searching for their next vehicle solution. Matthew has led company efforts in their partnership with United Way, including activating a record participation level by Capital employees in their giving campaign. Matthew enjoys spending time with his wife and family and is proud to make Salem a wonderful place. A fabulous fact, Capital Auto Group is the Salem Chamber's longest tenured member. Thank you for supporting the Salem Chamber for 94 years. Join me in welcoming Matthew Casebear and our sponsor for today's forum speaker series, Capital Auto Group. Well, thank you very much, Kathy, and to everybody on the Chamber for uh, inviting us to be a sponsor and for letting me have a few minutes of your time uh, before I introduce our keynote speakers today. But yeah, uh, I'm fourth generation. My middle name is McKay. So Douglas McKay is my great grandfather. He also uh, is the name at McKay High School. Uh, he was actually elected for a second term as governor and then got called up to be Secretary of the Interior for Eisenhower. So his career, like you said, Kathy, I mean, I, I don't know how you follow that one. <laughs> but uh, it's been, you know, it's been really fun to watch that progression as the generations go along because every generation, uh, my brother and I are the fourth, Every generation has moved the property, moved the stores, and built a new building uh, and expanded the empire. So like Kathy alluded to, that continues. We're building a brand new 72,000 square foot Subaru store that's uh, right, right here on the same property out here just off the parkway. But because we're so invested in the community, we couldn't just build a store and have a bunch of concrete surrounding it. So uh, as part of our initiative here, we've got a big pavilion that's going to be an event space. Uh, that you'll see if you drive out here onto the lot, as well as a pet park. I mean, the turf and the hops and the jumps and all the stuff for the for the pets. Of course, it's Subaru, and we all know they love pets and animals and all that, so we're giving our part there. But we're just trying to make it fun out here so that if you come to buy a vehicle uh, or even just looking around, it's a fun place to be. We, we don't consider ourselves in the automotive industry. We consider ourselves more in the hospitality industry. So any of the stores that you walk into or anywhere you go, we try to make it fun for, for anybody that's here. That includes our employees uh, and our customers. And as far as Salem goes, you know, we, like Kathy said, we've been a chamber member for 94 years. We've been uh, in the area, we've had Chevrolet for 94 years, and we intend to be here for a lot longer. And we really, really, really depend on the community to give back. Um, you know, we depend on them to come in and purchase from us, but because of that, we give so much out. I mean, we just confirmed this morning, we've got another 50,000 plus dollar donation heading to the Willamette Valley Humane Society as part of the Subaru Share the Love program. Last year, our contribution to the United Way from employee contributions almost alone, 95% of this dollar amount was from employee contributions. $280,000 all went to the local United Way, which as we know in this last year with COVID relief and the wildfire relief and all of that has gone to such um, great places and areas of need in the community. And that's what we're all about. Uh, we encourage our employees to get out for what we call a day of giving. So they each have up, up to eight hours each year where they can get out and volunteer for a local 501c3 nonprofit and give back to the community. Or if they want to contribute financially, of course, we, we encourage that as well. But I just want to say thank you. You know, we've, like I said a couple of times, we've been here a long time and intend to be here a lot more. Hopefully there's a fifth and a sixth and a seventh, you know, a lot more generations to come. But, uh, but I appreciate the, uh, the opportunity. And it is my pleasure to introduce our keynote speakers who I think we have on the line ready to go. We've got uh, representatives Brian Clem and Shelley Bossart Davis. I'll start with Brian. Brian is a fifth generation Oregonian, 
born and raised in Coos Bay. After serving as student body president, hey, so was I, Brian, uh, he graduated magna cum laude from Oregon State University. After college, he worked for Oregon State Senator Cliff Trow before moving on to work for United States Senator Ron Wyden. Brian's been appointed by two governors to the Oregon Student Assistant Commission, Assistance Commission, and was serving in his fourth term as its chair and his second term as president of the Salem City Club before resigning to serve House District 21. In 2000, Brian established his own small business, on-site PC Help, and in 2010, he co-founded an international trading company, Pangea Trading Company, which focuses on exporting Oregon goods abroad. He serves on the Community Council of the Willamette Academy. He and his wife, Carol, live in South Central Salem near McKinley Elementary, my alma mater, uh, with their active daughter, Kohana. Shelley Bossart Davis is rooted in Lynn County and Oregon's agricultural community. She grew up on a family farm in the Tangent and Shed area. She attended Oregon State University where she earned a bachelor's degree in business administration. She spent the last 12 years alongside her parents and siblings helping grow the family farm and trucking business. Today, the farm has a global reach shipping Oregon agricultural products to farmers as far as Japan and South Korea. Wow, that's really cool. Shelly advocates for her community and industry as an active volunteer. She serves on the Government Affairs Committee for the Albany Chamber of Commerce and previously sat on the local United Way board. In 2016, she was appointed to the Lynn County Budget Committee. She is involved with the Lynn County Farm Bureau, Oregon Women for Agriculture, Oregon Trucking Association, and Oregon Seed Council. Nationally, she has served as president for the U.S. Forage Export Council, and she sits on the advisory committee for the Agriculture Transportation Coalition. Shelley is passionate about agriculture education, sitting on the board for the nonprofit association, Oregon AgLink, and volunteering with three local schools through the Adopt-A-Farmer program. Shelly and her husband, Jeff, have three daughters who are active in 4-H and FFA. They prefer to spend as much time as possible in the barn, taking care of their animals, including raising hogs to show at the Lynn County Fair. So without further ado, allow me to uh, let them take over. Brian Clem and Kelly Bossart Davis, welcome and thank you. First and foremost, it's Shelly. We got, we got to get, we got to get that part out there. <laughs> So uh, can you all hear me okay? I had some background noise. I could also pull the headset up if it's if you can still hear background noise. Okay. It's Shelley, good. what what is your timeline like? There's so you can go first if you need to, is, is what I'm trying to figure out. Nope, I think we're okay. I think I don't have caucus until one. Um, and so to uh, the Salem Chamber and anybody who's listening, you are getting myself and Representative Clem literally in the midst of a recess. Um, we've been, we were sworn in and we're um, actively in recess waiting for our caucus meetings to start and then we're going to go back in. So the timing could not have been better. I was sweating it for a little bit, but um, Brian, I'm good. So uh, please go ahead since you are the Salem resident. Well, uh, thank you. And first of all, let me just tell folks, I highly respect and adore Shelly. She was on my um, ag committee in her freshman term. And uh, then I joined her business and labor, well, the one that she is more senior on in my in uh, the most recent term. And we work well together on nearly every issue. Sometimes we have to fight and cry and hug it out later. But um, she's just a tremendous legislator and a rock star that Oregon needs to keep their eye on. Um, Willie, what a wonderful uh, set of remarks you gave and if this isn't recorded where we can view it later i want to beg you for a copy of your remarks because that is the playbook that i've needed to hear step by step for what people need to be doing and i personally in any venue i'm at from now on want to take some of the steps you mentioned and i think one denouncing white supremacy that it exists but we have to fight it. And two, to be actively anti-racist. And those are things that are incredibly important if we're ever gonna come back together. And I guess the reason I wanted to take this opportunity when Tom offered it to me Friday was, right now is a very pivotal moment. And I think that we're already in the middle of a societal and civic reset, but we have to have a political reset as well. And it's not as hard as you would think for people who thought of themselves as enemies or political combatants to come back together. So I just want to take a minute to tell you two stories. 
25 years ago this month, in fact, I think it's about a week from now, I was working for a congressman, Ron Wyden, and he was in a heated battle against a then Senate president of the Oregon Senate, Gordon Smith. And the two of them had spent the whole Christmas holiday beating each other up mercilessly on the airwaves while we're all trying to get along and you know be nice to your crazy uncle Larry. They are killing each other and accusing each other of the worst possible things you could imagine. The election ended up being decided by, I think, one-tenth of one percent. After that, Senator Smith ran for Mark Hatfield's seat and was elected. I got lucky enough to be a staff person as they sat down, broke bread, made peace, and proceeded to work together in the most collaborative fashion that got them national accolades for how two former enemies could work together. And I, I was a staffer, so literally the missive was given. You give Senator staff, uh, Smith's staff anything they need. No secrets, no political strategizing, no calculating. You work with them on every single project. Every town hall, we're going to do them together. Every bill we work on, give them the chance to sign on. Everything was on was left by the wayside. And they had really, really gotten you know vitriolic, and the consultants who made money off it had gotten vitriolic. That was 25 years ago now, and Oregonians loved it. I went on lots of those town halls as staffers for the Wyden Smith town halls, and people loved it. And as more people leave the political parties, period, and become non-affiliated, we should not forget that we have done it not that long ago, and we rewarded those two senators with re-election both the next time they, they ran. So then let me shift to another one. And this one was all him, not me. In 19 or I'm sorry in 2006 I was elected about two weeks before I got sworn in this other guy representative Vic Gilliam got appointed and Vic was this handsome guy that I knew to be the brother of a lobbyist and I saw him on the tv at my dentist's office because he was an actor and they had paid him to do some tv ad and I'm like, oh, I think that's that guy that just got sworn in right before me. And he took Representative Max Sumner's place when he passed away of cancer. And Vic and I might have been on a committee our first term. We maybe passed in the hall a little bit. But then in the first re-election, a longtime farmer buddy of mine was running against him. And I made the decision to actively support this guy. His name was Jim Gilbert. I think I donated like $13,000 of PAC money. I went into Vic's district multiple times to lead canvases, to have town halls. And every time I would do it, I would get this cute little note from Vic that just said, Rep Clem, thanks for visiting our district. Love Vic. And he turned the other cheek. I mean, I was doing everything I could to get rid of him. <laughs> and he turned the other cheek. And we became the closest friends you could possibly imagine after that. And it was all him and his grace realizing that we don't have to be combatants just because there's elections. And, you know, Ken Hector's on this call. Ken knows, you know, Vic and I, we would um, we'd go over to the Dorchester. That was the Republican um, uh, conference. And I would didn't go to the conference, but I would host a, a, a reception at my home over there for for those folks. Well, then Vic started getting campaign ads against him for palling around with Brian Clem or donating to Brian Clem. He took a lot of heat for our relationship. And then I asked him um, at one point, would he be willing to, to do an ice bucket challenge with me? And my wife's mom had just died of Lou Gehrig's disease um, about eight months earlier before the, the, the ice bucket challenge. And so Vic, being the actor he was, um, he wanted to write a script and like not just do a 10 second thing, but, we, but do this whole entire program. And you can Google it. It's like Brian Clem, Vic Gilliam, Ice Bucket Challenge. So he wrote this script, which I would play if we had time, where yeah, we both are acting like we're talking to each other about legislation. And then our staff dump ice over our heads respectively. But we act like nothing's happened. We, we're trying to talk our way through the thing except it was so cold and there was so much water because our staffs hate us rightfully that we could barely get the words out. Um, but little did I know that a year later, 
at the kitchen restaurant, Vic would tell me he had been diagnosed with ALS. And I mean, I just immediately started crying because I knew what it meant. I had just lived through someone dying from it and she lived in our home. And Vic's strength and courage to continue forward after that horrible news is the legacy that I don't want us to forget. And I don't want us in the house to forget. Vic crossed the aisle many times on really tough issues. He, he was, um, I think, the only Republican to support a non-referral of the driver's license bill for people who don't have proper documentation to be in the country legally. He supported it, and he even supported it not going on the ballot. He was primaried over that issue. He won. In the midst of that primary, I said I wanted to volunteer for him, but he also said that he was getting attacked on mailers for our friendship. So I disguised myself and drove in his car while he went door to door. And I was the driver in my OSU hat, hanging out, you know, just uh, getting the pamphlets organized and things. And he prevailed and he proved that the Republican Party can look past a single issue and a tough one for them, immigration. But agriculture and others needed that driver's license. Bill and Vic stood with his district and with his principals and his electors saw that. So as he got sicker and sicker, he asked me one time, I'd like to get this bill passed to honor Mark Hatfield, his beloved Mark Hatfield. And I was about to leave the legislature, frankly. I, I mean, I was within a, a week of resigning and um, going to pursue a different line of business. And he meant so much to me in the way he treated people and others that I decided it was worth it to, to stick it out. And that session, in the end, we didn't get his bill passed, but all 60 of members of the House adjourned and marched on the Senate, and we all occupied Peter Courtney's office and demanded a hearing for Vic, who then went in to talk to Peter Courtney about why this bill couldn't be voted on. And you know, Vic never disclosed to, to, to anybody what happened in the meeting. But afterwards, when I kept wanting to push the bill, he said, Brian, that's not what God wanted for me, it turns out. It's not that bill. That was the unity the House needs to have, and that was also the chance for me to, to minister to Peter. We didn't even talk about the bill. We talked about all these other things that pain him and experiences that he's had and experiences I've had, and I realized that it wasn't the bill that mattered. It was rebuilding that, that sense of family that we had been losing. So this last June, Vic died, and it was right in the final days of our um, of our, I think, first special session. And I was lucky enough that that um, Becky had given me a little bit of a heads up and I got to go over and hold his hand and sit with him the, the few days before he died. And he was so strong until the end. He could still type out and write jokes and he would constantly be plying us with his missives and his jokes and his, and his opinions from his iPad. But I haven't really got to say goodbye to him yet publicly because um, we haven't been able to really have a session where we could talk about those things. But that message that he gave me, which is, I know you tried to oust me. I know you tried to get rid of me, but I still want to work with you, brother, is the one that we now have to do. We have to find our shared purpose. We have to find our unity. And in his final speech, Vic said this. He said, and he wrote it to all the House members. He said, love others as you love yourself. That's an act of true freedom. If you bite and ravage each other, watch out. In no time at all, you will be annihilating each other. And where will your precious freedom be then? And folks, that's where we're at right now. We are biting and ravaging each other. We're finding every opportunity to try and prove the other wrong and be right. And we're not talking about, we're talking about them and their fault and we should be talking about us and we, and what we can do together to combat racism, to bring back our economy, to keep people safe. And our politics has to be reconfigured to support that. And I'm gonna, I'm gonna switch and, and, and let Shelly talk because she is a wonderful legislator and we need to change our rules in the way we operate in Oregon and others to give bipartisanship a better chance. And you know, for me, what it's meant is I've chaired a committee for seven terms now, 14 years. I've never had a party line bill come out of my committee. 
I have also told my caucus that I will never be told by my caucus who I can vote for for speaker. And I did it again this year. It's not a caucus decision. It's my and my district's decision. And it's not a party thing. And, and if we have a candidate you know, for speaker that isn't the caucus favorite, I insist that we all should be allowed to vote for that person. And minority reports, those are often considered procedural. You're supposed to stick with your party. Today on the House floor, I reiterated those cannot be considered procedural. And those need to be something where if the minority party has the better idea, then we stop thinking ourselves as two tribes and we act as Oregonians and we pass the better idea. And so there's a series of fundamental reforms and other things that I think we can do. But at its heart, I think it's really what Willie started off with is we got a lot of work to do and it's on us. And you can quit and leave or you can stay and fight and make your home better like she did. And I wanna stay and fight and make our home better. Thank you very much. Thank you, Brian. And, and I will attest to um, what he said. I, I witnessed it just on the House floor literally an hour and a half ago about those rules that need to not just establish but encourage bipartisanship. And even said, it was actually right after um, Representative Bill Post spoke and Clem was next and he actually said, basically, Bill, that was a good idea. And you just don't see that very often. <clears throat> I definitely don't have the stories that Brian does. This is, um, I just got sworn in for the second time and um, can't claim rookie status any longer, I guess, um, which is unfortunate because it's very easy to claim rookie status um, when you're trying to figure all of this out. Um, and man, did it look different. You know, as I'm looking to some of these new, brand new legislators in this time of COVID, we all know how hard it is to um, work our businesses and, and work with customers and our employees and try to keep them safe. And then I, I look at some of these new freshman legislators that have no idea how any of this works. I remember myself two years ago, and they have to do it virtually or in this time of COVID. And it's as you all know, it's extremely challenging. So um, those challenges, um, just as we were debating House rules today, just a few hours ago, um, you see that, he mentioned both of those things, you see that those people that are just wanting to have that bipartisanship, and then you're also seeing the us versus them. We are living in a tough time. We are, we are living in a very tough time. It is hard to watch. It is hard to be a part of. Um, and so I, I definitely don't deny that those those two things are true. Um, Willie, I have to say, um, I was listening and watching Floor at the same time, and you said something about your husband being okay with you gallivanting around Salem and Oregon, I think is what you said. And and you doing what you were meant to do. And um, I have to say, I have a wonderful supportive husband. I have three teenage daughters, um, which is crazy, I know. Um, but I, I also believe that we are here for a purpose, that each one of us are here for a purpose. And that the, the words that Willie said starts at home, starts in our businesses, starts with us. Um, and along with Clem, completely take that to heart. Um, and they also both said, we have a lot of work to do. I was actually quoted in the newspaper over the weekend. Um, you know, everybody wants to get your opinion. You need to make a statement. And, and so many times I, I push back against that because I just believe that sometimes politicians say too much, that sometimes they need to listen more and talk less. And, and so always needing to have that statement, always. And, and I, I basically said, I have a lot of work to do. And, and that goes for legislating, that goes for representing my district, that goes for um, making sure that uh, I'm in a position to be here uh, for a reason. I will say that I um, was not student body president. I was not on any sort of, um, any sort of, uh, any sort of politics, any sort of government. I grew up on a farm. Um, I was driving tractor at 12 years old. Um, and that, that's what I did during the summer and a totally different life than what I'm experiencing now. Um, I've always loved the business side of agriculture. I love transportation. Um, I own a trucking company and um, there's not a lot of women that own trucking companies. And so I have to just say that um, as speaking of women really quick, uh, Julie Parrish texted me today and I think that you guys will find this 
statistic interesting. She texted me and she said, 10 years ago today, she was sworn in and Republican women represented 16% of the House caucus with five. Today, there's 39% of the House Republican caucus is women. And um, I think that's notable. I think it's, um, I don't know if it's cool, pretty cool to be a Republican woman th these days. Um, we have a much bigger voice, um, but I still say we have a lot of work to do. Um, that's as us as Oregonians, that's as us as Republicans, that's as us as women. Um, and so I completely acknowledge that. As we're moving forward, I unfortunately don't get to um, sit in Representative Clem's committee this this year. I was taken off of ag, um, which is very unfortunate because I love it, but I was put on redistricting. And so that's going to take a lot of time. It's going to take a lot of effort. And I'm actually vice chairing that committee. So I ask for all the good thoughts um, headed my way as, as I have to do that. But I think that that's a, a good point to mention because as we talk about whether it's bipartisanship or simply being fair, um, making sure that we're looking at everything we possibly can, that we're not on, in tribes or us versus them, but what is going to represent our district as Oregonians, that we make sure we're not doing any sort of gerrymandering, that we're not drawing, you know, taking crowns and everybody draws their own district, that we're looking at it as Oregonians. Um, and I think that that's going to be a big question. Can we do this fairly in this environment that we're in? So I think that that's, a, that's going to be one of the biggest issues uh, moving forward. Um, and I also jotted down, uh, we elected Speaker Kotek today um, as Speaker of the House. And one thing that she said today, she said, we need to listen to one another. We need to be kind to one another, which is easy to say, but here's the kicker. Even when the outside world doesn't want us to, Representative Clam can acknowledge that he's got members of his party, I'm sure, trying to pull him somewhere. I have members of my party trying to pull me somewhere. And, and, and I've always said, there's always those outliers, you know, 10, 20%, but the rest of us live in the middle somewhere. You wouldn't think that if you're just reading headlines. You wouldn't think that if you were reading some of the comments, I'm sure Clem has them on his social media. I definitely do. Um, and oftentimes that's why we just have to listen and not encourage that. And so I really truly believe that us as people, us as community, whether it's Salem, whether it's Albany, that we we live in that 80% in the middle. I know that, that Clem does, I know that I do, and you'll see us on the same page most of the time. Um, and I did write down, I literally wrote down that I was going to start off by saying that if it were up to me and Clem, if we were in charge, I promise you this would be better. Like, I promise you that Oregon would be a better place. I just know it. So um, I'm, I think that Clem and I should be in charge. I don't want the job, but I truly believe that, um, that Oregon could be better if, if, if we were allowed to uh, make decisions. Um, so other than acknowledging all of that, I think I was just a little bit sporadic, um, but wanted to acknowledge a lot of recovery. I hope that we're able to say at the end of this session, we were able to accomplish these things. I hope that we can say that we were able to recover from a multitude of things, wildfire, that's gonna be such a big issue. It, it hit our neighbors um, up, in, up in the canyon. Um, I was part of the evacuation site in Lynn County. Um, that's where I was in charge of the barn, shocking from my um, introduction, that doesn't shock anybody. I was in charge of the barn and all the evacuated animals, but we were also in charge of a people didn't have a place to go, animals didn't have a place to go. And so we were that evacuation site. I say that we set up a county fair in about 24 hours and that's what it felt like. We had over 700 animals um, brought to us within just a matter of hours. Um, and it was it was quite the task at hand. But we've all we've all experienced not the wildfire, but indirectly we all have uh, been where we are. Um, but recovery from wildfire, recovery from COVID, we don't know the timeline on this, recovery in our communities for that. And I hope we can say at the end of the session, recovery from um, hopefully bipartisanship, hopefully from some of the, the politics, the gamesmanship, the headlines, um, a lot of the ugliness. And so I plan to be a part of recovery for all of those um, things that I just said.
So with that, I will kick it to whoever um, is next or if we open it up to questions and answers. And, and I appreciate truly um, that you asked me to be here today. So thank you. Thank you, Shelley. Thank you, Brian. Um, it's a very awkward feeling to call to such uh, prestigious and counted on leaders on a Friday afternoon and ask for a pinch hit. Uh, I'll be very honest, neither of you deserve to be pinch hitters. And but this organization recognizes uh, the great work that you both do. And uh, I think in times of challenge, we seek opportunity. And uh, that's what we quickly did on Friday. Um, and so I think uh, I had a number of questions emailed to me and I will jump in and they are not softball questions. Um, and so the first one uh, that I'd like both of you to address is what, uh, what position do you stand on regarding uh, liability uh, for businesses? We saw that uh, schools received uh, limited liability uh, protection. Uh, please, if you could, share your perspective on what businesses deserve heading into this session. Um, I jumped off mute quickly. Um, I, I voted for, I worked on that bill as far as school liability. Um, I think that there needs to be liability protection. Um, that's as far as the um, specific details of it. I, I don't know those and I'm not sure who's working on it, but being part of business and labor, I expect it to come through that committee and that we'll be able to hear that and debate that. But I absolutely um, believe that that should be one of the first things on the docket. Thank you. So last, uh, I think it was July. Uh, so I will say I'm 99.99% I'm .99 sure all the Republicans were on board. 11 Democrats wrote a letter saying we wanted liability protections for businesses to be voted on uh, in that second special session. So if you add the two together, that was, I forget the, what the numbers were exactly, but 33 or 34. Anyway, enough to pass it. And so I was one who signed that letter. And as has happened to me a couple other times, I got called a traitor um, and some petitions were put out you know, against me for, for doing that kind of thing. But there was a, a work group that included leader, a majority, minority Republican leader, Drazen, and then Karin Power from the Judiciary Committee. And they did come up with a proposal that was ready to go. It dealt with customers. It did not deal with workers, um, employees, but it did deal with customers and it was ready to go. And it was held up for, frankly, unrelated political reasons. There was leverage that, oh, we want this other bill. If you're going to get that. And that's part of the example I'm talking about of rules changes or at least behavior changes that if the votes are there, which clearly there were 30 plus of us who, then you vote on it, period. And today on the floor, I again spoke about the need to have the, the it's the majority of the legislature, but often it's the minority party who has to bring some of these things up because you get compelled in your caucus to, even if you're a yes, can you kind of keep your mouth shut? And the answer from my perspective is no. I don't think that it's a good idea to have businesses operating in, a, in an environment where the bar is too low for a trial lawyer to get a client and try and shake somebody down for a settlement. You know, a quick, easy, give me my five, 10, 15 grand, you know, it won't go against your, or your insurance will cover it anyway. If there's an egregious act, yes, there should be liability. Gross negligence, yes, there should be. But if the standard is set appropriately and the incentives aren't perverse, you won't have people in fear of lawsuits because they know they're doing their best to follow all the guidelines. And, and at that point, they should be protected just like schools were. And I'll just quickly, I'll just quickly note, Tom, um, he was talking about those uh, during the special session. Obviously things are gonna be different here. Um, I would imagine that it would come forward. I believe that we have the votes depending on the language. Um, and so it's it's the rules are gonna be much different obviously here in the long session, we have the time, whereas the special sessions it's rushed and it's very, um, there's a timeline to follow. So some of the things that he spoke to couldn't happen during the special session, but certainly can in the long session. Yes, as Brian adeptly noted, the, most of these uh, claims have no intent to go to trial. It is rather to get a quick settlement and continues to just tear down and erode the small business model. Uh, while we have seen mega companies, mega corporations double and triple in size during this pandemic uh, because of the infrastructure 
and uh, the positioning that they have. And so the support for small business will go into my second question. Uh, we have are entering a day and time where small businesses are largely the ones being impacted the most. And uh, it is an incredibly crushing role to sit here in a chamber seat or be a chamber member on this call and watch uh, all these small businesses close their doors, many with no hope to ever reopen. So my question would be, there's a time, Brian, that you and I have referenced in the past uh, where any bill that came forward says for jobs or against jobs. Uh, could you two touch on that topic and the fortitude that will be required to take that lens in the 2021 session? Yeah, thanks, Tom. So I was talking the other day to the Government Affairs Committee, and we were um, you know, talking a little bit about this upcoming session. And I was recalling the 2011 session, which we were, you know, early days still, it turned out, of the, of the mortgage meltdown um, a great recession and we had a um, um these somebody made these pins that said jobs and everybody wore them around the capitol and then the frame of every bill was is this a pro jobs bill or or not if it's not maybe it needs to wait a few years and that was the whole theme until we're economically recovered we should be passing only pro jobs bills so i want to bring that back i got to figure out who made the pins and get the pins made again but i want to do something um shelly I'll, I'll put you on the spot here Back in, in spring, we had a work group that Shelly and others were on, bipartisan, 21 members, and we did things like advocate for um, some relief on the corporate activity tax deadlines, on uh, pseudo food payment deadlines. And I wanna reconstitute that group as kind of a jobs caucus or the common sense caucus or whatever we call it, I don't care, but a bipartisan group who people operate in the middle and they can actually kind of score the bills and say, this one's a jobs bill. No, this isn't a jobs bill. And then, you know, the hunters, they do that. I think that was the hunters caucus or sportsmen's sportsmen, sports people sportsmen. caucus. And yeah. you get this bright orange thing that says, this is a yes, and this is a red if it's a no. So I think that's a good frame for us to think about this session. I also want to say generally, Tom, on the small business versus large business, one of the things we don't do is ever have cottage industry exemptions or startup incubation exemptions. And so when I voted against the paid sick leave mandate, it wasn't that I don't want people or I want people to come to work sick. It was that they set the bar too low for when this regulatory new mandate kicked in. If it had been a hundred or higher when people have got their businesses going and stabilized, I'd be less worried about it. But when people are still on the edge, I worry about mandates. And so I've always categorically felt there should be kind of a cottage industry threshold that until you hit that threshold, you don't have to apply to these various new programs, paid sick leave, retirement security, other things that we've handed down over the years. And we should wait until businesses are more stable before we ask them to meet these new societal goals. Uh, I like it. There's Ooh, the with pin. the Oregon. Yeah, yeah, that's good, Tom. It's, it's, that was a very <laughs> oh. soft Oregon, but I like it. I like it. I've never been accused of a good, being a good drawer, but uh, we will, Brian uh, and Shelly, we will get those made in the number that you made. I will have, in fact, I see my staff already shaking their head. Uh, yes, uh, we are going to our printer. And if you are uh, willing, we'd gladly provide you a much better drawing and a look uh, and the numbers you need for distribution quickly. I like that. I like that. Well, and, and to add to the small business, um, the issues that we're seeing with our small businesses, specifically restaurants and gyms. I mean, there's obviously going to be more um, restaurants and gyms as far as in my district, I'm, I'm going to guess across the state, uh, just disproportionately hurt. Um, and there's a few, obviously we're concerned with what's going on regardless of how much we like the mandates being given to us or not. We see some injustices happening in front of us. My one that I see over and over again are women are leaving the workforce. Um, speaking of jobs, I see women leaving the workforce um, at a scary rate. And, and I have no numbers other than just stories of people telling me and calling me and it's based around education and they're trying to get their kids educated. Um, and so that I see is something that we have to look at 
um, restaurants, gyms. I know that um, in my district uh, through the county, through this last special session, and, um, or maybe as emergency board, some of the money that was allocated and trying as a county to try to get that money out. I know you guys understand that as the chamber, how do you get that money out quickly and also fairly has been um, one of the greatest questions that we've had to try to answer. Um, and so we we were able to do that, uh, especially for our restaurants and gyms, a few others, but those were, that were shut down kind of in this last round. Um, but also I'm gonna nod just quickly to some bipartisanship as far as the gyms are concerned. Um, there was a bipartisan bicameral letter that went to the governor. Um, and you know, it's it's just a common sense, at least let us, you know, open with a limited occupancy. I mean, just some really common sense. And so very disappointed that we're still not at that point. Um, but there is that bipartisanship. There is that uh, the, the two different chambers working together to try to get some of these to change, but completely acknowledging that that is problematic. I don't have an answer, but it is absolutely problematic. And it, it pains me as I talk to some of these um, employees of some of these businesses. Um, and man, I, we haven't even touched on some of the uh, woes of the employment department and, and, and the unemployment insurance. I know that has attacked my office and bar none what we've worked out worked on more than anything else since March. So massive issues surrounding that. And I don't have a fix it, but acknowledging that it has been the greatest uh, problem over the last, um, since COVID has hit us. President Gordon, we are out of our commitment time for both Representative Clem and Representative Bossart Davis, but thank them very much. Uh, we'll excuse them to go do their duties. And thank you both for appearing. You're all stars for our state. And we are very, very appreciative of your appearance today. Thank you. Thank you very thank much. You. Thanks congratulations, everybody. Willie. <laughs> yeah, congratulations, Willie. All right, um, Tom, would you like to take a few minutes and just talk briefly about the Salem Eats Challenge? Yeah, I think we'll key up our video right now, which will be screen shared. Uh, Manuel's taking care of that. And then Zachary will just have a couple of brief notes uh, and then we turn it back over to you, Kathy. All right, thanks. Hello, Salem. We couldn't be more excited as a chamber than to kick off 2021 with our Salem Eats Challenge. It's a great opportunity for you to get out and celebrate all the local restaurants that do an outstanding job to make Salem so special. Sponsored by our friends at Willamette Valley Bank, we have the opportunity to go see the wonderful restaurants across all of Salem, show your food, and show your support for the local companies that make this community so strong. Here's how it works. Select your favorite participating restaurant, order the meal of your choice, and then take that meal in front of the Salem Eats Challenge poster. You'll take a selfie and then go to the Salem Eats Facebook group page, hashtag Salem Eats Challenge. Tag the restaurant you ate at, and 10 lucky winners will receive a gift certificate to great local restaurants for their support. Participate and have a great time enjoying the restaurants that make Salem such a special place. So for many of, uh, of you that don't know or have not seen already uh, anything about the Salem Eats Challenge, our organization partnered with Willamette Valley Bank uh, to provide an opportunity for consumers to go out and help support our restaurants in a unique and fun way. Um, one, the easiest way to participate, go visit the Salem, uh, Salem Eats Challenge uh, .org website, see the participating restaurants. Uh, get some food, find the Salem Eats uh, Challenge poster that's right behind Tom there. And uh, you post it on Salem Eats Facebook page, hashtag Salem Eats Challenge, and tag the restaurant that you bought it from. The awesome part about it is uh, in February, we will be doing a drawing for the winners, and there will be 10 winners that will receive gift cards for local restaurants ranging from $50 to $250. So it's easy to participate. It's a great way to help support our restaurants. So. Thank you, Zach. Sure appreciate that. In closing today, I just really want to say a big thank you to Reverend Greg Peterson for helping us out this morning, start off our, our forum speaker series, and really congratulate you, Willie. Mrs. Mrs. Willie Peter, Mrs. Willie Richardson, this is this, it's just very special for me <laughs> to have you receive our Spirit of Salem Award. 
And to, I just want to thank you for your important message that you, you gave to us today. I'd like to thank our, our uh, House representatives, uh, Shelley Bossart Davis and Brian Clem also. And a huge thank you, Matthew Case Bear and the Capital Auto Group for sponsoring today's event. Um, while our legislature has started already, as you can tell, uh, the official sessions, uh, 21, 2021 session starts next week and the Salem Chamber will have real time updates. We will providing, be providing that. If you are interested in receiving those, please contact us and let us know. And I have some breaking news today. This is exciting. The Fly Salem team will be presenting to Sky West on January 28th in St. George, Utah. Woohoo! We, they are working so hard to bring air service back to Salem, so we wish them the best of luck. Our next forum is on Monday, February 8th, when we will discuss the future of Salem's colleges and universities. So, as Willie said, I'm going to paraphrase, we have a lot of work to do. So let's get going. And I have a happy, a really good January, good month, and we will see you on February 8th. Thanks so much for joining us today.